Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm going to, right at the outset, uh, make a unilateral change to the topic, because the topic said a peek into tomorrow's Gen Z. And I was just talking to him that it's difficult to fathom what's happening to today's Gen Z. To even try and figure out what's happening to tomorrow's Gen Z is a hazard that I uh, simply cannot feel myself up to be. Um, the first thing that, you know, since, uh, since we are talking about the, the person who is going to be your employee, uh, what kind of a young employee uh, you have to deal with, I think it's important to understand that almost anyone who is under 45 years in India today, and that's the bulk of your workforce, right? Uh, or the bulk of the workforce that HR people have to deal with. Um, is somebody who's grown up under two influences, which people of my generation simply did not know or have or could even have dreamt of. These are all liberalization's children. These are people who uh, come into the workforce after 1991. And then even more importantly, these are people who, during their growing up years, uh, especially the ones under 25, 30, uh, are people who've grown up with social media and with digital connectivity. So when you think of these two trends, these are the, these are the defining uh, properties or attributes uh, of the employee, the Gen Z uh, of today. Uh, it fundamentally creates the chemistry of that person, which is very different from the chemistry uh, of people of my generation or one generation after me. Uh, you know, when we grew up, and when we became employees of an organization, while growing up, our lives were organized in fairly distinct silos. Uh, and all those silos were always dominated by one influence, a person or a trend, but one influence dominated it. So if I was at home, possibly the parents were dominant. If I was in school, uh, very little of my home went to the school. Uh, my principal and teachers were dominant. If I was at the playground, uh, you know, the, uh, the superstar footballer of the colony was a dominant player, uh, and, and I would be one of the guys looking up to him. Um, when I joined a company in the 80s, uh, I was a, largely a passive recipient of rules, of, of the framework of that organization, because uh, I fell in conformity with what I was told to do. There was an HR manual constructed by the bosses, uh, and I lived within that HR manual. So all my, my worlds were broken into silos, and in each silo, there was a dominant god. Even media, uh, even media was dominated entirely by what I call voice of God editorship. You know, editors would get into a room uh, and decide that this is the story flow for the day, uh, and then they would play those stories out, whether on television or on newspapers, uh, and audiences were expected to lap it up. Audiences were expected to take that as the order of magnitude ordained by God, uh, who's the editor. Now, all of that's gone, and that's gone uh, because all those silos have completely been smashed by the phenomenon, by the twin phenomenon of digital connectivity and social media. And all, a lot of it owes it to this one device, which is such an empowering device uh, that it's very difficult for today's employee or today's young person or today's me, if I, the me that was there in the 70s and 80s, if that me was to get transported today, uh, it's very difficult or impossible to box me into a silo because I am forever connected with everybody. When I'm at school, I'm not just at school. I'm still connected to the world. Uh, I am forever, if I'm at home, I'm still connected to the world. Uh, so, and, and it's not just connectivity. The important thing is that this is two-way communication. So I am no longer a passive recipient of commands or initiatives or frameworks. Today, I am somebody who will actively engage I will demand that my voice be heard. Demand, not expect. I will demand that my voice be heard. And I have the tools at my command to be heard. I've got social media, which can amplify anything I want to say. I am forever surrounded by 
uh, very empowering information. It's not the information which is the product now of one mind. It's now the information which comes at me. It's the power of a collective. More importantly, a collective which is far more intelligent than one mind could ever be. Uh, there was a time I used to get my information from an expert journalist, an expert commentator. But today, if some subject is buzzing or trending, uh, then I just don't get one voice on it. I get voices of eminent experts, uh, domain giants who will jump in and have a point of view. Uh, and I have the ability to converse with them. I have the ability to put my point of view across. So it's a very different young person you're dealing with today. A young person who is used uh, to being fully empowered, to having his or her voice heard. So that's once you understand, and, and a young person who's grown up, who's increasingly now living in a free enterprise system, and therefore does not have uh, to be hidebound by rules and regulations uh, or be shorn of global influences. If something today breaks anywhere in the world, our young person uh, is as exposed to it and has as much of an ability to, uh, to influence it, to engage with it, as any other young person in the world. So I think once you accept that, then you start crafting your HR systems uh, around it. And, and, and to me, uh, when I started my second innings as, a, as an entrepreneur uh, about two, two and a half years back, I think that was one heck of an eye-opener. Uh, because in the earlier uh, innings, you know, you were dealing with largely one-way communication. Uh, it, it came from the leaders and it went to the troops. And now, every morning that I do an editorial meeting, which I started doing after almost 15 years of having not done it uh, in the earlier innings, I'm amazed at the kind of uh, um, creativity that, that young people bring in. Our editorial meetings today are dominated by 23 to 27 year olds. And they uh, have a way of looking at stories, they have a way of looking at issues, they have a way of uh, bringing a spin to it, which is very different and it's refreshing. But I think you have to understand that uh, the, 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 the forum belongs to them. And I think that's where even HR learnings for every organization would have to be. The forum belongs to them. If you want to have a new initiative, there's a lot of talk about paternity leave. There's a lot of talk about menstrual leave on the first day of uh, the cycle. Now, when this story broke about uh, an organization in Mumbai talking about menstrual leave, there was a heated argument within our organization. Now, in the, in the, in the good old days or bad old days, depending on what your memory tells you, uh, there would not be anything like that. HR would put out a something on the notice board saying the management has decided that this and this uh, will be done. Should you have any suggestion on it, please put it in the Dropbox. If it, if it gets seen, it'll be, get, it'll be seen, but you know, very rarely would anything change. But we had such a heated debate, and I was astonished by one thing. I thought, uh, being, again, you know, old world, um, used to sort of much more system and structure, um, I thought, that a lot of the young women in our organization would welcome it. I was surprised at the pushback that came from a lot of young girls, uh, 23, 24 year old, uh, who said, why do you want to once again create a differential for a male employee and a female employee? Uh, because this is again telling the world that I am a somewhat lesser uh, employee than a male employee, that I need special accommodation. I was surprised. I thought here was a policy which was trying to be very pro, uh, pro woman employee. But that's not how half of them saw that. The other half actually did see it like that. But then there were nuances. Then why on the first day? And someone, you know, and today young people talk absolutely uh, openly and transparently and that why only the first day? It's the third day of my period that becomes extremely painful for me. So why should just the first day be given off? And you know, you realize that here you are in an environment that you simply have to talk your way through. You cannot assume, I had assumed, I had assumed uh, that this would be welcomed across the organization. It wasn't welcomed unquestioningly at all. Uh, it was, there was a lot of comeback, a lot of intelligent comeback. 
a lot of significant comeback, a lot of comeback that you had to, that you had to engage with and, 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 and argue with. That's one example of if you today want to run HR policy, it will necessarily have to be as a conversation. It cannot be a, um, a, a, a circular put on the notice board. Uh, those days are gone. And you also have to accept that anything that you today put out will have to be evolutionary. Uh, it will have to factor in continuous comeback from your uh, employees, from your team members, and you will have to evolve as you go. Uh, the other thing is you'll have to be absolutely transparent in, in your objectives. Uh, do not try to couch your objectives in, uh, you know, larger than life symbolism or larger than life glory. If you are doing something, if you want to do a six day week because, uh, you know, uh, your budgets do not permit you to have a 6% or 10% extra workforce or 14% extra workforce, talk with your employees and tell them that I'm willing to do a little trade off uh, for you. If you're willing to come in on Saturdays, then I'm willing to do this for you, willing to grant you, uh, you know, uh, have a system which will grant you a few more compensatory offs or whatever. Uh, anything that you today try and evolve, do not think from your own perspective of, hey, I'm doing a noble thing. Uh, you simply have to talk with your uh, team members and listen to them and evolve uh, as you go. Uh, why is it that very few organizations uh, do that? Uh, and I think, for me, uh, as I said, the whole uh, thing was an eye-opener. At Network 18, would I have done the same thing? Possibly not, because these things wouldn't even reach to the top. We, we didn't have those kinds of hands-on interac interaction with teams that I'm having now again, because you know now we are a 200-member or a 300-member team, uh, as compared to a 6,000-member team, when you, when you sort of get very remote from day-to-day uh, -day work, and you're, you're living in the world of boardrooms and presentations, and not really in the thick of uh, action. Um, I think a lot of organizations fail to do this, uh, some of the older and the larger organizations, because really a lot of older people are still at the top. Uh, and uh, a lot of older people still believe that organizations need to run in a far more structured manner than today's young workforce is willing to accept. So I think that's, that's one. Uh, so there will be a lot of semantic adherence to these uh, these words of flexibility, transparency, two-way engagement. There'll be a lot of semantic adherence to that. Um, there will be, um, uh, uh, you know, the real buy-in won't be there. That's one of the main reasons that I think a lot of older organizations are unable to come to grips with a very fluid, a very uh, organic, forever changing uh, HR system. Uh, the other reason, of course, and, and I think there is some merit in it, uh, but it's a challenge for top management to see how they can handle it. Uh, a lot of, if you want to be totally transparent, uh, then you need to worry a bit about the confidentiality of the information that you're sharing with your team members. Uh, the other reality is that a lot of young people today are very mobile. Uh, you know, when we joined, when we would join uh, companies in the 70s and 80s, we would have a reasonable, reasonable sort of time frame in our mind that we would spend, you know, maybe the first seven to eight years of our working lives. And once we've reached a particular level, we would probably see if there are prospects outside. Today's kids, you know, I mean, two years is it. A at the end of two years, uh, they really want to be uh, looking out to do something new with themselves. So it's a genuine concern how transparent you become. It's a genuine concern on how much confidential information you share. Not just confidential, WIP. There's a lot of projects which are just in, in, in the works. And therefore, you may not be able to uh, share a lot of the details with your team members that you would uh, like to if you want to be a completely uh, transparent organization. These are, these are fundamentally issues that uh, managements have to come to grips with if they want to create the kind of... Uh, flexible HR systems that I'm talking about. But I think it's a challenge that, that managements have to take because uh, in today's digitally connected employee, fully empowered with information, uh, flexi working hours is now, you know, flexi working hours is now a 10, it's a decade old phenomenon. If you think you're being very modern, if you're saying flexi working hours, uh, things have gone far beyond that. Uh, so 
work from home and you know all of those things. I think the core of my learning in, in, in my second innings has been uh, A, to unlearn a lot of the structures that one had grown up with, even remuneration structures. I mean, honestly, a lot of people are asking, a lot of young people are asking me, what is this annual increment business? Uh, why can't we have a, a continual assessment? And if I'm performing better than uh, the person, why is it that you still want to pigeonhole me into grade 15% increment? If I'm, a, if I'm a great sort of learner and a quick guy, and I'm maybe five years his or her junior, why can't I be on the 30% track or 40% track? Now, you know, you have to find answers to these. These are, because there are internal balances you have to deal with, but you also have aspiration and ambition. And you also know that the young person there has got a lot of finite, he's got a very finite um, ambition to stay with you. Uh, and you have to learn to accept it and enjoy it and celebrate it. So I think these are the thoughts that I would leave you with. But I can tell you uh, that uh, one thing is for sure, don't try and overstructure your HR systems. Because that is a, that is a very old world thing to do. Uh, you'll, as, as HR leaders, HR managers, as top management, you simply have to learn to be extremely flexible, extremely open-minded. You have to take contrarian feedback. I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, my last example, I know I'm running out of time here. Uh, the placard said four minutes, uh, about four minutes back. So I, I must uh, wind this up. But I, I just want to give you an example, one more example, which, which again, has struck in my mind. If you, you would recall there was a... Sometime back, there was this film uh, which generated a lot of debate among young people, Pink. A lot of debate among young people. And we had massive debates in our newsroom as well. Uh, and being a parent of a you know, 20 plus young girl, young lady, I was, I was coming at it from a point of view which said that, listen, I fully understand empowerment of women. I fully understand your rights should not be constrained. I fully understand the need for young people's independence. But listen, safety is something that you've got to be concerned about yourself. Will you put yourself in harm's way uh, only because you want to assert your freedom? But you know, I got such a pushback from, from the newsroom, pushback from all my young colleagues in, them, in their 20s, male and female, both. More female, less male, but both. That we don't care. In the name of security and safety, our security, our safety, don't try and constrain my movement. And I said, but safety? They said, we don't care. It's the state's concern. It's society's concern. But don't try and hem me in because of your false sense of... I said, it's not false. I tell my daughter that. They said, we don't care. Don't try and spin this narrative about how you are concerned about our safety. Therefore, you will constrain my movement. And I realized that, you know, the world's changed. You have to just to learn to accept, to, uh, accept that change and, and uh, as I said, even celebrate that. Thank you very much for being such a patient audience. Thank you. <laughs>